All right, so we are going to start. Welcome, everyone. This is the uh, panel on campus activism. And my name is Catherine Sammy. I'm the moderator. I'm the associate director of the Center for Research on Women. And <laughs> woo um, And the center is younger than I am, but that's OK. It's great. Um, uh, we, uh, I'm so excited about this panel for many reasons. Um, and I helped organize it. And first, I want to. I acknowledge that I made one mistake, which was to not invite um, an undergraduate on the panel. And I realize that's a very huge omission um, because undergraduates are doing amazing work. So I recognize that. And hopefully we can have more panels on um, student activism. Because the, the thing that's been very clear to me at this conference is A, how many students are out there. B, that the hegemonic narrative about students being apathetic and not doing anything is just a bunch of baloney. Um, students and faculty and campuses, our sites, as the last panel, if you were in here, which was amazing, uh, these activists and scholars from uh, Mexico were talking about the classroom as a, just a space of pleasure and um, uh, amazing possibility. And um, I think that's probably what's inspiring most of the panel to be academics and be on the way to becoming academics is that potential for, for engagement, political engagement and intellectual engagement. So. I'm really excited about this panel. I hope we can have a lively discussion. And um, I hope that we at the center can continue to do a lot of stuff on sort of student activism and, and the, you know, the important coalitions between students and faculty and administrators on campuses and um, activists. So I'm going to introduce, um, we have five panelists. Um, uh, and I'll introduce them in order of, of how they're speaking. And um, they're from all around the country, which is also very cool to see um, so many uh, people from around the country doing great work. So our first panelist is Abigail Bogg. She's a PhD candidate in cultural studies um, and teaches American studies and women gender studies at the University of California, Davis. Obviously, the UC system has been a site of tremendous uh, mobilization. Her teaching and research place feminist, queer, and post-colonial studies in conversation with critical university studies. And she's currently working on her dissertation, which I can't wait to read. It sounds amazing. Um, called Perspective Student Potential Threat, International Students in the Making of the Neoliberal U.S. University. Um, and she, her, the title of her talk is A Student Protest or a Pride Parade. Notes on the UC Crisis. It's probably right there. Okay. <laughs> um, so our second speaker will be Debanuj Dasgupta. He's a doctoral student and graduate teaching associate at the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Ohio State University. Uh, he's a sociologist and geographer by academic training, and his current interests lie with feminist political philosophy, critical queer, race, disability, and migration theories. And in 1994, he's an you know, awesome activist past, um, Devanush founded the first HIV prevention program for men who have sex with men in Calcutta, India. Um, our third panelist, also a very dear, beloved friend of mine, uh, Stephanie Luce. She's the Associate Professor of Labor Studies at the Murphy Institute um, at CUNY. And she has gained national and international recognition for her research on living wage campaigns. She's really the person that all activists go to on this question. Um, and on the impact of globalization on jobs and workers, she's a, a you know, steadfast, amazing activist. She's the author of Fighting for a Living Wage and the co-author of The Living Wage, Building a Fair Economy, um, and also The Measure of Fairness and many books on um, uh, low-wage work, globalization, and living wage organizing. And she's also involved in a very interesting project, um, which maybe she might talk, to, talk about, but I don't know, it's really not the subject, but the Asia Floor Wage uh, campaign. Um, our fourth speaker is uh, Sandra Soto. Sandra is Associate Professor of Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Arizona in Tucson and the co-editor of the journal Feminist Formations. And again, Arizona, a place of incredible um, activism in the face of uh, incredible despair. <laughs> uh, she holds a PhD in English with a focus in ethnic and third world literature from the University of Texas. And her first book, Reading Chicana Like a Queer, The Demastery of Desire, came out in 2010 uh, and replaces the race-based oppositional paradigm of Chicano literary studies with a less didactic, more flexible framework geared for a queer analysis of the discursive relationship between racialization and sexuality. 
She's currently working on a book tentatively titled Feeling Greater Mexico, which mobilizes queer theories of affect to pursue unlikely connections between critical transnational studies and US ethnic studies. And our last um, but not least panelist is um, Jess Kajo. She is a second year uh, Loyola University Chicago graduate student in social justice and community development. Uh, and she has worked for Aramark at Loyola for five years since she was an undergraduate student and helped lead the successful union organizing campaign um, to form a union and win a contract for nearly 200 food service workers employed by our market Loyola, and she's gonna tell her amazing story. So um, please welcome this very wonderful group of people. First, I, I wanna thank Catherine and Janet and Hope and Pam and all the students who work at the BCRW for the work that went to this conference. Um, it was actually studying the 1982 conference, uh, the sexuality conference that started my interest in the intersections of queer studies um, post-colonial studies, feminist studies, and this emerging field of critical university studies. So it's all the more exciting to be here because of that. So thank you all for being here. Um, as Catherine mentioned, my name is Abigail Boggs, and I'm a graduate student at, uh, in cultural studies at the University of California at Davis, um, writing my dissertation on the transnationalization of US higher education, uh, with a focus on the recruitment of international students to US universities. Um, also though, in 2009, 2010, uh, possibly the most contentious and spectacular year of activism um, around the current drive to privatize or neoliberalize the UC, at least so far. Uh, I was hired as the graduate student assistant and campus liaison for the UC Davis chancellor, so the head of the UC Davis campus, um, and the dean of graduate studies. So in this capacity, I attended campus meetings, uh, system-wide meetings, and actually international meetings in Switzerland um, of the World University Forum, a really interesting um, organization. Um, I also worked with my fellow graduate students, uh, Liz Montegary, who's in the room and is no longer a graduate student, um, Toby Beecham, who's also no longer a graduate student, and uh, Cynthia Degnan as part of a group called Queers for Public Education, um, which I'll say more about in, in a bit. Um, all of that is to say that during this year, I worked with the administration, participated in student organizing, and also tried to understand the changes um, occurring within the increasingly entrepreneurial US university uh, through theorizations of human capital theory, uh, deliverables, uh, kind of the new managerial shift in higher education. So it's from these multiple positions that I'd like to talk briefly today about the effects of the current political economic climate, or what is widely referred to as the economic crisis, um, on the University of California as a specific site, um, and also as some have argu argued as an arbiter of the future of US higher education. I'm especially interested today, given the topic of this panel, in how the university community responded to the increase in student fees and the concomitant and totally predictable uh, targeted decreases in campus services and academic offerings. So, as many people might already know, uh, the most recent incarnation of the California student movement began, began to take form in the summer of 2009. In response to indications from the UC Office of the President and the President himself, Mark Udoff, ooh, um, and the UC Regents, uh, the governing board of the University of California, that the state budget crisis would necessitate significant fee increases. Uh, students, faculty, staff, and other campus workers across the UC staged a walkout on the first day of classes, the same day Mark Udoff was um, profiled in the, in the New York Times as the big man on campus, uh, justifying the fee increases. When a mid-year fee increase of 32%, which effectively raised tuition from under $8,000 to over $10,000 in the middle of the year, so right, starting winter quarter, rather than like at the beginning of the fall, so you could actually plan for that. Um, was, so that was authorized in the fall of uh, November of 2009. Uh, many people were quite surprised that UC Davis, which uh, is typically thought to be a rather apolitical and science-heavy campus, mounted one of the most extensive protests, resulting in the, in the arrest of over 50 students and one professor. Um, even at this early moment at Davis, the most vocal organizers were students with previous activist experience. Students who had worked the Cross-Cultural Cultural Center and the LGBT Center on campus, and students who explicitly identified um, in all their work as queer, feminist, first generation, undocumented, and students of color. The same seemed to be pretty true actually across the entire UC system. For instance, Berkeley uh, graduate student Chris Chen commented in the South Atlantic Quarterly on the quote, emergence of a multi-ethnic coalition of students, staff, and professors that drew on both a tradition of labor militancy and a radical legacy of anti-racist, feminist, and LGBT analysis and organizing. So while UC administrators reacted to protests by diverting attention and blame to Sacramento, the capital, uh, student frustration with the changes on campus and with protesters themselves actually manifested in more oblique ways. On February uh, 27, 2010, the UC Davis LGBT Resource Center, the single publicly dedicated space for queer, queer and trans people uh, and activism on campus, was spray painted with anti-queer words and phrase, uh, phrases. 
This was, um, as you also might know, one of a series of violent incidents across the UC campuses, including the now notorious Compton cookout, uh, a noose that was left in the library at UC San Diego, assault on gay and trans students at UC Riverside and CSU Long Beach, and the appearance of swastikas in public and private spaces at UC Davis. And that's just some of the things that were happening, all in this kind of condensed moment between um, the November protests and protests that came later. In response to these incidents, um, and also in response to my insider knowledge of how the administration was kind of planning to respond to these incidents, um, Liz, Toby, Cynthia, and I released the Queers for Public Ed statement, arguing that the racist and homophobic incidents were not anomalous, or really all that new, um, but were instead part and parcel of the very culture of the university as the administration raised fees and cut services, especially services utilized by already marginalized students. Uh, while well, the administration seemed to think these acts were a distraction from the budget cuts, in some ways actually a very welcomed distraction from the budget cuts, one that could be addressed by catching the perpetrators of the crime, putting up video cameras around campus, um, calling for civility, and kind of most egregious of all, plastering the campus with hate-free zone signs. So these like stickers that went up across campus that were nonsense. Um, we asserted instead that the attacks against queer students and students of color were not surprising at all, actually, at a time when it was precisely these students who were visibly and vocally insisting on access to public education and the redistribution of resources. Uh, the statement was released on the eve of March 4th, 2010, the International Day of Action in Defense of Public Education. Um, and that day, that the outpouring of queerness at the UC Davis protest illustrated that the state statement's sentiment echoed with, and indeed had been anticipated by other students. Rainbow flags, I mean, these are actually images from the protest that day. Um, rainbow flags, uh, patches made by Liz's uh, feminist and queer studies class that read Imagine Otherwise, and signs proclaiming Queers for Educational Justice, a nod to New York's Huey J, uh, Queers for Ethnic Studies, and Bottoms Against the Budget Cuts saturated the crowd of over 500 students. <laughs> I like that one too. Uh, of over 500 students that gathered on the campus at the campus center and eventually marched towards I-80 um, and endured a prolonged standoff with dozens of police officers from several counties wielding tasers, rubber bullets, and pepper spray, all of which were used. Um, as my title alludes to, local media coverage took the presence of queer symbols at the protest as a sign that students were confused as to whether the <laughs> They couldn't figure out if the protest was about budget cuts or homophobia, and thus the newscasters missed the very queer intentions of student critiques, of the privatizing university, and of neoliberalism actually as a broad political, economic, and cultural phenomenon. So while there's a great deal to consider about this action, what interests me is how the varied and overlapping identities and analytical frameworks of queerness, racialization, feminism, and citizenship status informed student activism. For instance, as students occupied buildings, they negotiated who, due to their gender, race, or class privilege, citizenship status, or able-bodiedness, felt comfortable taking certain risks. Who could be arrested, and who felt okay about doing that, and who could take on other equally significant roles in sustaining the movement. There seems to be something particular and powerful about the kind of queer critique students waged against privatization at the UC and beyond. One that refused single-issue politics or the administration's efforts to pit students against workers, or to pit students particularly against those people in prison. In the last week, Udolf and the Regents have once again publicized their new, this time a multi-year plan for fee increases, and protests are already, already underway at Berkeley. Meanwhile, UC Davis, uh, the chancellor, uh, released her own plan to actually grow the campus, largely through recruiting international students, so clearly a topic that I'm interested in. Um, this is a strategy for funding universities that is not unique to Davis by any means. I think the Times actually had an article a few days ago about this big push. Um, it's also importantly, for my work, not unique to this historical moment. And it's something that's been going on for decades, most notably in the 70s, which we could align with like, the birth of this kind of neoliberal university thing. But more on that at some later point in time. Um, so basically, the process and the crisis continues. And while I fear deeply for the UC and for the future of higher education, I do strongly believe that feminist and queer campus activism matters and has lasting effects on the campuses where it occurs and for the students who participate. They certainly aren't perfect. For instance, we might consider the possibility of student collaboration with labor activists and local public schools, particularly K through 12 and with parent organizations. Yet student actions, even in their sometimes seeming failure to enact, failure to enact lasting change, do spark momentary alliances and formations with still unknown potential. Students understand in ways that I didn't even know they would, um, that within the neoliberal university, their identities and experiences simply um, cannot be understood in the ahistorical and individualistic frames of diversity and multiculturalism that so often undergird neoliberalism. But instead, they so actually turn instead to questions of vulnerability and risk and community in really powerful ways. Their understanding is, in, is, is uh, this understanding is clear in their, actually in our, I would hope, displays of anger and rage, but also in the insistence upon hope and in the desire for a different future. 
You know, Abby, you always inspire me. Um, your methods, methods are really exciting. Um, on that note, so I'm going to also keep this really brief, and mine's very informal. I first, first of all, I must admit, I'm very new to Ohio State University, um, but not new to the state of Ohio. I was gone for about 11 years, and I was in New York, and when I came back to the state of Ohio, I was just very aware as to what was happening in Ohio um, in the last couple of years. I, I, prior to joining grad school, I was working on the Obama campaign. He has somehow tried to make money, but um, I was just very, very aware that my friends, who did not necessarily have the kind of cultural access I had, were all jobless when I came back after 11 years. And um, they're largely working class, white, gay, male friends of mine with whom, across race and class tensions, I somehow have a tenuous, tenuous friendship. So that sort of transformed my own thinking as, um, and my commitment to certain kind of racial justice and what that racial justice would mean. So that stems, so, so that kind of stemmed my continuous interest in remaining active on campus, even as a graduate student. So the state of Ohio, um, as many of you know, is, uh, is also otherwise billed as the heart of it all state. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one can often, you know, when I was canvassing, I would always see the heart of it all car plates, um, doormats, um, it's, you know, boldly announcing to me as an outsider that I have been placed solidly in the heart of the United States of America. So, um, and I, I, I will argue, and I will continue to argue hopefully throughout my academic career, if I have one someday, um, is, is that it is the heart of US neoliberalism in many ways. A lot of experiments of US neo neoliberalism have been silently conducted in Ohio and the Midwest, including Midwestern neoliberal sociology that kind of works to ruin critical sociological thinking. Um, folks like Gary Becker's work was first taken up at Ohio State University. So um, it's kind of the silent center of US neoliberal lab laboratory. And what's happening right now at OSU is this, um, this sort of push to make Ohio State University um, the enterprise university. Um, yeah, somehow they read Abby, they read Foucault's memos and, and thought, <laughs> Enterprise Institute, Enterprise Society, Enterprise University all go hand in hand. And so this, this sort of the Enterprise Society, the Enterprise University sort of plan is to create exceptional scholars. And the idea, the state, Ohio State University only receives 10% of its money from the state of Ohio. And yet the plan is primarily interested in deregulating all state requirements of how the university spends its money. Um, in the name of creating innovation and in the, uh, in the name of this budget crisis that, that is supposedly happening in the state of Ohio, um, some of the lawmakers, uh, primarily the Ohio uh, Board of Regents, the University System of Ohio Board of Regents, have come up with this plan. Um, so it, it, they wanted to completely stop, if, re, if needed, the 10% of state money, and they would rather continue to, I mean, we are also called the Coca-Cola campus, so, because we are sponsored by Coca-Cola, and uh, we are sponsored, we also, we have relationships with Sodexo. So, and students have been organizing against Coca-Cola and Sodexo for a while on campus, um, and until like 2008, when the university started as part of this upcoming, at that time it was called Charter University Plan, now it's called the Enterprise University Plan, has started deregulating all its um, contracts. So it's, it has an independent private contract with the food industry, so Dexo, and so when students now have been regularly protesting and going up to uh, President Guy's office, and even like in spring quarter, four students were arrested, um, they are told, or we are told, that, well, we cannot really partake or do anything. This is an independent contractor. You will have to deal with Sodexo. So the strategy that then students are left to figure out is how do you intervene into this sort of, you know, monstrous of an assemblage that's calling itself to be, um, we are working separately, these are all contractors. And some of the responses are something like, you cannot subcontract responsibility. So, I mean, 
<laughs> I mean, I mean that, that's what neoliberalism wants to do. It wants to sort of take away the question of responsibility, put it back to a single person. So the students have been designing these logos called you cannot subcontract responsibility and sort of figuring out collective modes of action to sort of uh, work in this. And I would specifically sort of want to highlight when I came into campus, our department informed me um, that there is an undergraduate student group called Queer Influx and um, they were organizing a queer radical influx and there was kind of a panic moment. No one really knew what these students were doing. So, you know, I was asked to go talk to them since I had been an activist. And when I went to meet and to talk to them, I was really excited because these were, these were folks who wanted to use the department money, the different department's money, to make space continuously for um, queer activists to come on campus. And so what they did was, ostensibly we worked with my department, the Women's General and Sexuality Studies Department, and we have a formation called DISCO, Diversity and Identity Studies Collective at OSU, where all the sort of ethnic identity and sort of women's studies, sexuality studies formations come together to, uh, to fill a pot of money together. So we ostensibly worked with DISCO under the brand of doing queer theory to bring in uh, transgender organizers who were writing uh, letters to prisoners and to bring in um, queer transgender organizers who were making porn and we were showing these porns and talk, discussing their work using university money and to talk about through that, to talk about through that where are the points within which we can collectively come together to talk about pleasure and resistance um, in ways that sort of deal with the larger system, but look very playful. So on that note, I will just say, um, if you, my, in my syllabus, because I, I teach 110, which is on intro to women's studies, my final project, since our, our university's mascot and the icon of uh, Ohio State is this masculine Brutus Buckeye, um, and I found out that Brutus Buckeye, this mascot, his like or his or her or its um, Brutus's like statue was carved out of uh, male athletes. So I said to my part of my syllabus is for my students to argue what Brutus Buckeye's race, gender, sexuality, and class is. And my hope is that that silently and secretly I'm queering Brutus Buckeye. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone. So I um, I was asked to just speak a bit more con about some, a couple of campaigns that I've worked on. Um, I've done student activism and camp campus activism for many years, and as many of you know, the challenge of that work is really um, how to find the fluidity from campaign to campaign. Um, student activism is naturally transitory. Students leave for the summer, not, not everybody, but many, or they graduate and move on. And we don't always feel connected from campaign to campaign. And we don't feel connected over uh, the history of time. And we certainly don't always feel connected to the community around the university. Um, and that's always been hard to do, but I think it's even harder to do now because the truth is our university administrators are using some very sophisticated tactics um, and they even hire you know, very high priced lawyers that help them deal with student activism and campus activism. So they, they know what they're doing when they do divide and conquer. They know what they're doing when they put things off to a study group. Um, they've, they've gotten advice from some very sophisticated uh, law firms on some of this stuff. Um, <laughs> and so sometimes we find if we make a demand on campus, we want uh, living wages for campus workers, they say, well, that, that'll come out of student tuition. Or if we want um, smaller class sizes, they say that'll mean more work for the staff. So they find very sophisticated, sophisticated ways to pit, its, pit our, us against each other. Uh, against one another, you know what I'm trying to say. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna talk uh, about two campaigns that I've worked on that tried to branch over some of these divisions and tried to build um, connections. Um, the first is something called the Public Higher Education Network of Massachusetts. And um, I was involved in my faculty union for many years and every year we would, um, the union would vote to endorse a democratic candidate for some office or another and give millions of dollars to that candidate who would then usually get in office and um, do harmful things to us. <laughs> so, um, you know, we argued that, well, why don't we stop giving money away and use that money to build something else, build a lasting institution that is um, 
organizing ongoing around the issues we care about. So we built this thing called the Public Higher Education Network at Massachusetts, Phenom. And what it did was bring together faculty, students, staff, um, campus members, um, community members, alumni, and we said that we're not gonna be pitted against one another. We're gonna make some basic demands, and these are gonna be ongoing demands, and we will not be divided. Um, and what we said is we're gonna have a statewide coalition, and we're gonna make our principles be uh, very visionary and, uh, and also pragmatic. So we know we have to do the immediate, you know, pragmatic demands like stop tuition increases and uh, fund higher ed, but we also wanna make broader visions, uh, broader demands of what we want another world to look like. So we also called for free higher ed for everyone. Um, so we said, you know, we know we have to just fight tuition hikes in the, in the immediate, but in the long run, we're calling for a free higher ed. So our five demands were um, full funding for the university system, uh, including the community colleges, making it affordable, making it accessible, um, hiring more uh, faculty and staff, and democratic control of the universities um, by the communities and the people who uh, attend them. So in each of these cases, like I said, we made different demands that were short-term, medium-term, and long-term. So they included everything from the DREAM Act uh, to, um, as I said, free higher ed. Um, our kind of foundational principles were that, you know, this idea of a rising tide lifts all boats, that if there's free higher education, um, for everyone that everyone benefits from that system and also on the principle that it takes grassroots mobilizing and coalitions and this is not something we can win from the top down by electing the right people or through lobbying. Um, some lobbying was necessary. Um, so anyways, it's, uh, this network is just a few years old. We've had some success. We've won um, increased um, um, state money for student grants. We've defeated um, some ballot initiatives that would have eliminated property taxes and income taxes in Massachusetts. Uh, we've gotten some of the stimulus money to go to saving jobs. But most of all, what we're doing is just building this coalition that says we will not pit workers against students and that we are in this together. We will also not pit community versus the university because we are also in this together. So. Um, that was kind of the idea around it, which is to say, can we just extend behind one defensive campaign to the next? Um, and so that's uh, the Phenom Network. Um, the second example that um, Catherine asked me to talk about is the example coming out of Wisconsin um, from this spring. And many of you probably uh, heard what was going on there as the governor tried to eliminate collective bargaining rights for public sector unions. Um, I had been a graduate student in Wisconsin in the 90s and I had been active in um, grad student union and also a group called the Student Labor Action Coalition. Um, and so right before uh, you know, the protests broke out um, this spring, well, when Governor Walker announced his plan to eliminate collective bargaining and call out the National Guard on workers, um, the Student Labor Action Coalition, the undergrad activists, contacted a national network of 20, uh, no, 10, yeah, almost 20 years of alumni um, from this network to say, we're gonna need your help, start getting ready to come to Wisconsin, start sending us money for legal defense fund and so forth. Um, so we also, we, we quickly mobilized through the undergrad, we had been um, student activists together and we had been activists in our unions together. Um, and we got you know the, some of the support, I mean obviously lots was going on in Wisconsin, but we, um, did what we could to get national support to go to Wisconsin. We had a lot of faculty from around the area go there and bring their students. Um, I went and I brought some of my students here from CUNY. And what we tried to do was just to help um, bolster this movement that was very local in terms of Wisconsin, but to keep it framed as a national struggle. And what was interesting about that um, fight back was that in the one sense it was a very narrow attack about collective bargaining rights for public sector workers, which sounds like you know, who would care about that in terms of an undergrad? But the Student uh, Labor Action Coalition had very much a frame that what this was about was attack on our public institutions and our public good. And we wanna defend this idea of a public education as belonging to all of us. Attack from public workers means you're attacking our teachers, you're attacking our staff, you're attacking our rights to education. Um, and I think one of the reasons why the protests in Wisconsin were so big um, was from that tradition that's been going on in Wisconsin that says that we are not just students or just workers uh, or just community members. We're all part of the same system. We're all part of the same community. Okay, so I should um, end um, with just uh, a few um, lessons that I think that we might draw in order to try and keep um, this continuity in our student and campus work. 
Um, one is that even though we're often sucked into these immediate short-term campaigns, these pragmatic demands, um, we should keep in mind that our student activism actually does have a long history and a legacy. The stories fuel future stories, um, and they can build continuity from one year to the next. And this is our example of what we were doing in, in Wisconsin in the 90s, um, helped things go in the, in the, in the, into the anti-sweatshop movement and into uh, student living wage work, um, and in, into today's um, fights for the rights of workers to do collective bargaining. So try and you know remember that even though your campaign is might be short, it is part of a historical legacy of, of activism and fight back on the university. Um, the second is thinking about how to frame our immediate demands in the broader context. Um, we, are, we are often fighting around tuition. We're fighting for expanding classes or ethnic study programs or something like that. But all of our demands do connect to a broader community. And thinking about ways to connect an immediate demand with a broad visionary demand um, can help expand um, our campaigns and keep them alive. And the final one is that I think at the end of the day, one of the things we're all doing is trying to defend this notion of the, the university as a public good. Um, my own experience has primarily been at public universities, um, but I think even private universities, we have to demand that these are public institutions. Private universities get a lot of their money through a public money for research. They get a lot of student loan money that comes from public sources. Um, they, they, get, they don't pay taxes, and so they're in fact getting a subsidy from the cities that they're located in. I think um, Columbia and NYU own most of the land in, in Manhattan, something like that. So, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, um, um, and the, the faculty are public intellectuals. Pa faculty make major interventions into public policy debates. And so by definition, they are public um, characters and we need to have public accountability from them. So I think that whether we're in a private or public university, demanding that, public uni that universities and education is a public good, demands to us as a public, is something that we might unite our, cam our campaigns around. Thank you. So I want to join in the chorus and extend my thanks to Janet, um, Catherine, Pamela, and all of the others who have worked hard and imaginatively to facilitate the inspiring conversations we've been having all weekend long. I also want to thank them for the much more ordinary and daily work involved with keeping an organization like the BCRW alive and well. Although I was too young to have been at the Barnard Sex Conference itself, the subsequent anthology, <laughs> sorry, Beyond Pleasure and Danger, introduced to me by my then professor and mentor, Anne Svekovic, was instrumental to my own development as a sex-positive queer feminist scholar. It's an honor to be here on the BCRW's 40th birthday. And now on to Arizona. One of the first impressively short-sighted and consequential decisions President Obama made upon taking office was to appoint Arizona Governor Janet Napolitano, a Democrat, to Secretary of Homeland Security. As Obama would have known, the governor's vacancy would automatically be filled by Jan Brewer, who was at that time Arizona Secretary of State. Brewer immediately began signing the kinds of bills emerging from our Republican-dominated state legislature that Napolitano had routinely vetoed, including SB 1070, known as the Show Me Your Papers Law, and HB 2281, known as the Anti-Ethnic Studies Law. Of course, what we are witnessing in Arizona is larger than Brewer herself. It is the result of a well-funded, well-organized, multi-pronged, and energetic national neoliberal campaign to distribute resources upwards by, among other things, devising newer and more thorough ways of criminalizing undocumented migrants, normalizing the policy of detaining undocumented migrants. We take that for granted now that that's the way that it's always been, that we would detain um, undocumented migrants. This is a new technology. Holding these detainees in for-profit facilities, such as those owned by the CCA, terrorizing anyone who dares to speak out against Sheriff Joe Arpaio's bald human rights abuses, and conscripting as immigration cops all state employees from secretaries to clerks to teachers to professors. Critical race theorists Michael Omi and Howard Winant would probably refer to this list as Arizona's latest racial projects. As they describe it, a racial project is, and I quote, simultaneously an interpretation, representation, or explanation of racial dynamics, and an effort to reorganize and redistribute redistribute resources along particular racial lines. 
Even though it gets far less attention than the anti-immigrant legislation, the most insidious racial project in Arizona's political conjuncture, in my mind, is the campaign to prohibit K through 12 ethnic studies. I want to turn to that racial project because the desire to demonize and shut down ethnic studies, Mexican American studies in particular, is clearly motivated by the fear of an educated and engaged brown citizenry capable of recognizing, analyzing, and pressing back against all of these racial projects. Even though the term ethnic studies never actually appears in HB 2281, the law's author, sponsor, and relentless promoter, Tom Horn, who was at the time state superintendent of public instruction and is now, thanks to HB 2281, sec, um, state, state attorney generally, general, excuse me, repeatedly has said on record that he designed HB 2281 in order to shut down the Tucson Unified School District's Mexican American Studies Department. It's something that he's very proud of. It's on his website. Comprised of four dense pages and divided into two sections, House Bill 2281 involves K through 12 education in the state of Arizona. Section one pertains to ethnic studies, and importantly, and this is something that often gets missed in the uh, analyses of, of the law. Importantly, Section 2 grants the school apparatus the right to met out to various kinds of student discipline and punishment. Even though these two sections seem to read separately, when we read them together, we come to understand the law's one-two punch. That is, Section 1 immediately raises the specter of, hate, of violent, hate-filled students of color, and Section 2 provides an array of mechanisms for disciplining disruptive students, including suspension, expulsion, failure, corporal punishment, and reasonable use of physical force. Section 1 of the law begins with the one sense one sentence declaration of policy, quote, the legislature finds and declares that public school pupils should be taught to treat and value each other as individuals and not be taught to resent or hate other races or classes of people. If that declaration seems baldly ideolog ideological, then it will come as no surprise that in Tom Horn's own words, the law is not about education or academics, it is about values. The law names and prohibits four vague and rather outlandish actions. Um, a school district or charter school in this state shall not include in its program of instruction any courses or classes that include any one of the following. One, promote the overthrow of the United States government. Two, promote resentment toward a race or a class of people. Three, are designed primarily for pupils of a particular ethnic group. And four, advocate ethnic solidarity instead of treatment of the pupils as individuals. And this is an exact quote from the law, these four things. Um, criteria one and two do much more than describe what is being pro prohibited. They perform a rhetorical trick, whereby ethnic studies and by extension brown youth is from the get-go circumscribed through images of anarchy, sedition, groupthink, violence, terrorism, and hatred. These images are meant to compel a visceral response, and they do compel this response in Arizona, from the public, most of whom will have no first-hand knowledge of what actually takes place in ethnic studies classrooms. By the way, we should note that the clumsiness of the four-part list here, from the unparalleled sentence structure to the awkward verbs, is no doubt a reflection of the clumsiness of the ideas that the words are trying and failing to express. And we could go on and say a lot more about these four things. Uh, but in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. By trying to intervene in the thoughts and the values of students, HB 2281 also reaches into a realm that is more often on the private side of the public-private divide erect erected by classical liberalism. And we might understand that this intervention, or we might understand this intervention as the active production of what Lauren Berlant has called dead citizenship. That is the production of a depoliticized public sphere in which citizens affirm symbols and perform correct private behaviors, but are utterly unable and unwilling to engage in live political contestation. As the active intervention of HB 2281 indicates, dead citizenship is not a state that is achieved. It has to be ongoingly produced. This is an intervention, right? It is the wearing out, the deadening, the chilling of speech, a process of shutting down engagement. 
Even those of us on the left who are able to identify this deadening and who seek to resist it find it difficult to continue to speak out and do more than just participate in the pablum of acceptable phrases. There are specific challenges inherent in writing, publishing, and speaking against racial projects such as HB 2281 before they have congealed. One such challenge involves trying to guess in advance who will be in your audience or who will read your published work. Writing and speaking about ethnic studies in Arizona involves a lot of strategizing, deleting, second guessing, looking over your shoulder, and self-censorship. For example, in an essay that Miranda and Joseph and I co-wrote entitled Neoliberalism and the Battle Over Ethnic Studies in Arizona, I panicked at the very last minute, just before the essay was going to uh, be sent off to the publisher, I panicked at the very last minute and decided to le delete three paragraphs lauding TUSD's Mexican American Studies program, the program that HB 2281 tries to shut down. I deleted these paragraphs uh, that lauded to USD's MAS program for its commitment to social justice and its fostering of organic intellectuals. I became afraid that both our compliments themselves and their appearance in our article, which is explicitly critical of classical liberalism, individualism, and the neoliberal upward redistribution of resources, would bring yet more harm to the program. One more example of this chilling effect. Last month, I received my annual invitation from our LGBTQ student organization to lend my name to their National Coming Out Day project. Every year, the group takes out space in the student newspaper for an LGBTQ spread consisting of an impressively long list of out professors, students, administrators, and staff. For the first time in 10 years, I didn't do something as simple as lend my name on National Coming Out Day. The hate mail I've received from speaking out against SB 1070 and HB 2281 and the threats is that unsettling. It's that effective. Which is to say that we on the left need conversations like the ones we've been having this weekend. How to resist the wearing out and deadening. How to do better than the pablum of acceptable phrases. How to think through the onslaught of legislative assaults that exhaust us. The erosion of reproductive rights, healthcare, and public education, to name a few. How to do all of this while attending seriously to what Amber Hollabau described yesterday as our heartbreak. Never have I firmly, more firmly believed in collaboration than at this moment. We need to sustain each other, a collecting and sharing of resources. We need more than ever queer world building, the sustaining of life in the face of this onslaught of efforts to wear us out. Thank you. Okay, hi, I'm Jess. Um, I go to Loyola University. I've been there for six years and I'm a master's student. I'm studying social justice and community development. And I'm coming here from the perspective of a worker. I've been a food service worker for five years at, in the cafeteria. I started working there when I was a sophomore. And I really got the job initially because I was working at Panera for a while and I was like too far away from school. So uh, I started working sophomore year at the cafeteria because it was convenient. I lived on the exact same block. So I could go there and then I worked as a desk receptionist in another hall and then I could go to the cafeteria. Super easy. It was just like a convenience matter. And I would, the first day what I did was cut fruit for four hours. I was like, great, whatever. Um, whatever I can do for $8. Anyways. Um, and that's pretty much how I started. And the longer I was there, the worse it got. And in the difference between regular workers, as they used to call us, and student workers was definitely obvious because I could make changes to my schedule whenever. Like if I had a class, they would you know, accommodate for that. Or if I had an exam, they would accommodate for that. And if this were like another worker who had like, you know, childcare problems or something, they wouldn't accommodate for it. And um, so, but I didn't really notice those things because I was 19 and 20 and didn't really care. And um, when I went, I studied abroad in Australia and then I came back and that's when I started working like essentially 40 hours a week and doing school on top of that because I had an apartment and my mom's like, if you can work, pay for it yourself. So, um, so I agreed to like pay for most of my rent and I had all these new expenses that I had to do. So 
I started working 40 hours and then I started moving up to work in the morning and not at night and I'm working with everyone else and it's kind of like the big leagues in the cafeteria where you're working with all the cooks and everything all the time. So the kid gloves are off and the kid gloves are off in terms of how management treated me as well. And I started to realize that, you know, the kind of the kind of place that they are that they want to have is a place where everybody is separated. Literally there are Black people here sitting together, white people, very few, white people here, a lot of Chinese workers and then Latino workers who would, who would sit together. And in fact, the summer, the summer after my, what was it, junior year, is when they fired a lot of African American workers and hired about 50 Chinese workers, and in my cafeteria were about 25. And that was a tactic to get rid of all the people who were loud and proud and you know, always causing trouble and bring in people who they thought were weak and who they thought they could, they could essentially abuse even more. Um, and as I began to become friends with the, with the Chinese workers, I found out that some Chinese workers are being paid less than mi minimum wage. Uh, some people are making 725 when we're supposed to, everyone else is making 880. Um, so that was even more disturbing to realize. Um, my senior year, I met uh, like another cafeteria worker. We were working in the pizza station together. And he told me something that to like this day is still my light bulb moment, where he said, oh, do you know that um, uh, University of Chicago workers, they make like $14 or $14.50 an hour. I was like, what? For the same work, this slave work, they make $14.50? Like how is it that I make, at the time it was $9, how do, or no, still $8.80, $8.80, and they make $14.50, and that like blew my mind. And he's like, oh, they have a union. I was like, What's a union? I mean, the only time I had even like heard about a union, I think, was in the movie October Sky, which I only watched because I think Jake Gyllenhaal's hot. So, you know, it had like nothing to do with anything. I was like, minors, they have a union. Um, but I didn't know what that was, and so I immediately went home and I looked this up, and I'm like, what's a union? What? How can we get one? And this was in. Uh, maybe like April, like early April of my senior year, so 2009. And I was like, you know, I was talking to my best friend, Andrew, who also worked in another cafeteria, and we were both like, maybe we can get one in, like right before we graduate. And then, you know, everything's gonna be great. This place sucks, we definitely need one. Everyone would want this. And I looked it up, and I thought this was a great idea, so I went back to my friend, Casey, and I was like, hey, so I looked up what a, like, a union is, and we should totally get one, and this is great, and he's like, uh, slow down, like, you know, at the time everyone knew if you would even say the word union, there was like an unofficial policy where they would fire you or find a reason to fire you. So no one ever would talk about it publicly at work. And so he told me, you know, like, that's not a good idea, people get fired, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then I got a phone call, like, as it was, all this happened around the same time with weird stuff happening to me. I was coming off of the school shuttle bus, bitching about my job to my friend who was I didn't know at the time working with the union. And then as I got off the shuttle bus, I got a friend from, or a call from another friend who said, hey, um, your name is like, I got your name from this grassroots like social justice phone call list. And I was like, what? That makes no sense. Maybe like some stuff I did in high school, she, I was on some list. But um, they asked if I would come in for a job interview. I'm like, perfect, senior year, need a job. I studied international studies and French literature, so I like to travel and read not exactly something that I'm gonna get a job in unless I go to grad school. So um, I was like, job opportunity, great, I'm gonna go. And I looked up this group called Unite Here, which was a union. I still did not connect the dots because I am not as smart as the GPA suggests. But um, I went there and I'm like, okay, you know, they're asking me about what I know about it. And I said, oh, I know that you represent housekeepers and um, like hotel workers. And they said, okay, and how's your job? What do you do? And I said, oh, um, I work at a cafeteria. How is it? Well, it sucks, it's awful. And I like, proceeded to just complain. And, um, and then they told me that they were actually already considering to unionize that place. And that that was a place that was already, already on the radar. And did I wanna be a part of, of that process? And that was very daunting for me because it meant that I would have to stay there when I had spent the last six months practicing my run outside of the cafeteria and being like, I'm getting out. And everyone was so excited that I was leaving because people are like, you know, you're so young, like you get trapped in this job and I used to be young and I don't want you to be here. Um, and so I just felt like, you know, I couldn't sit here and complain and talk about all these things that I wanted to change 
and then be given an opportunity to not actually do anything. So, um, so I, st I kept working there, and what it meant was that I had to actually get to know my coworkers because unionizing a place means that workers have to workers are super separated, which is definitely deliberate by the company. Just like Stephanie was talking about of them of the university divide and conquering and them spending a lot of money on lawyers, companies like Airmark, which I work for, or Sodexo, or um, Chartwells, which is Compass, which all of them are part of the big three known in food service. Um, they hire really expensive union busters to specifically like strategize how to break up workers, which is if you see a workplace where where people are separated by race, that's great on the company side because it means that workers are never going to talk to each other. It's, they can easily create some like rumor that the Latinos don't like the black people and then people will actually believe that and they'll never come together to organize. So I had to get rid of my own like feelings that maybe someone didn't like me when that wasn't true, if a, a manager had told me that, and really try to get to know people. And that was by going out and spending time with people or connecting and talking about myself. Like, I had worked there for three and a half years, and the most people knew about me was that I went to school there and I played Ultimate Frisbee. And that's why I was gone most weekends. Like, that's all people really knew. They didn't know anything about my family life. They didn't know anything about, like, how I grew up. They didn't know anything about me for real, and I didn't know anything about them. And as I started to spend more time with my coworkers, I found out people, some people were homeless. Some pe I, I actually hung out with the Chinese workers who most of them didn't speak any English, but it's amazing when you are just sitting around a table and eat, sharing food together, how much you can really deepen your relationship. So now Chinatown is like my home. Um, I've had dim sum there a thousand and one times, and our connections with Chinese workers are really, really strong. So that was what we as workers had to do is really come together and get rid of all those like stereotypes of what we thought people thought about us and really start to realize, well, I don't have health insurance and neither do you. That's something I can connect on. I have been here for, some people have been there for 20 years, I'm still making $10 and you are too and you have a family to raise. That's something I can connect on. Even if I don't know your culture, I know that we're both suffering and that's something that we have to be honest about instead of pretending like everything is okay. Um, and then on the student side, I had, we had to figure out how to mobilize students because for the most part, like people come in, they, they you know, get their food and they usually just leave it a mess. And so you, there's no connection between the worker and the student except for when you're making your sandwich. And think about it, like how many times would you normally think to talk to the person who's making your food? Just as much as we're disconnected from the people who, can, who make our lives possible every day, you don't really think about the, like, the people who clean this room or the people who clean the bathrooms, people who clean anything, let alone the people who are making your food. You're just like, can I get a chicken pesto? And then I just make your sandwich. So um, we, I had to, we had to really start to like work with student groups in order to have them bring their own people to really start to build relationships with workers. And even to this day, I feel like that's something that we're still working at at Loyola. Um, but w the workers really had to like make the effort to go out and find the student groups and get them involved. And the first big thing that we did were classroom presentations where two workers would go to a classroom and we connected up with professors who are pretty down with stuff to talk to them about what was going on on campus and our organizing drive and how we wanted them to get involved. And it was like we blew every student's mind. They had no idea what workers were going through. They had no idea how much people were making. The woman who's there this year is her 40th year. Before our contract made 1450 for after 40 years of work. She's been there since she was 17, okay? And, and paid or $250 for health insurance a month. So this is the kind of place that we're working at. Um, and people did not know those kinds of things, like really shocking things. One of my coworkers who is 20, she had a miscarriage at work and could not afford to pay for the ambulance. So she walked, I work at the downtown campus. So she walked from Loyola to Northwestern University where there's a hospital, walked on Chicago Avenue in pain as she's having a miscarriage. That is the kind of place that we work for because the company refused to even pay for an ambulance for her. That's what we worked for. So people had to be really honest about their stories and what they're going through and talk and share that with students. And students had to react in a way that's not only just being shocked, but being like, okay, now what the hell can I do about this? The first thing we did was have like a caucus between students and workers and a, an opportunity for students to really get to know workers who had been there for years. And then that was to organize a huge student rally, which took place in this like 
um, big area on campus, on the main campus, and that garnered about 200 to 300 students, which was really great. And of course, there was endless amounts of CPD, uh, Chicago Police Department, and um, and Loyola PD, and for like you know me on a podium yelling, and some workers and some students. Really shocking stuff. Um, I did, obviously, I was thinking like you have to hire six CPD people for this little rally. It really shows you how much you're really starting to get to the university and get to the company when they do stuff like that. This entire time, at no point did um, the president of the university say anything. Mind you, I go to a Jesuit university, so you would think that so at some point the, all those Jesuit values that I went and I graduated with would be echoed, but no point did he ever say anything. Meanwhile, the young Jesuits were definitely behind us and came to everything and would, would bless. We made it all very holy so that it would um, work <laughs> with it. So they would, they would bless the rally and end the rally with prayer, and that really helped like, solidify us as legitimate and nonviolent. Um, anyways, so um, at near the end of the school year, the, the rally kind of put a lot of pressure on the company to, before in our negotiations, they kind of like fucked around and were like, oh yeah, we'll give you some money. Not really, all you deserve is 10 cents. That's what the negotiator said. You, what, do you, what do you mean you want to raise? All you deserve is 10 cents. I love that he said that because then I went to work and I went to class and I was like, guess what? All we deserve is 10 cents. They might as well spit in our face and people were pissed and it only ignited people more. So I was like, thank you for that little ammunition. And that kind of like how does go, uh, get the ball rolling. But then the end of the school year was fast approaching and we had to like try to figure out what we we're gonna do. Do we carry this into the summer where a lot of workers are on, on a, like laid off and students are gone or, and then we have to wait till next school year, what do we do? So then they gave us like a contract and we could settle it then or we could, or we could prolong it and it was insulting so we didn't settle. So we ended up um, waiting and going on into the summer and trying to figure out what is like the thing that we can really do to stick it to these people. And there's two big conferences that happen in the summer at Loyola, one of them being um, a Trappist monk conference, uh, which is essentially 90-year-old Trappist monks and nuns who come to this conference. And then the second one was the big Jesuit conference that's national of all the Jesuit universities and come and talk about you know, Jesuit ideals and education. So we went to the first one and we just passed out a very simple flyer that said 77% don't have health insurance, 73% make less than the city living wage, which is 11.18. That was shocking to people and these are like old people who think that this place is great and they were like infuriated that this was happening and someone flyered the director who said this is terrible, I'm going to Garanzini, who's the president. And he, so he went to Garanzini and said, you know, if you don't fix this, I'm pulling my conference next year. That's a $5 million loss for Loyola. Um, and then we told them, we threatened them with flying the very next conference, the Jesuit, the big, big conference. And that was a little too much, so Loyola called Aramark and said, settle this. And the very, they called us, all the negotiators, and they said, you know, whatever you want, we're ready to settle. And I was not on the negotiating team. There's seven workers on the negotiating team. And I, I, you know, I heard all this stuff that we might settle, we might settle. And then um, my friend Martin called me and he said, we settled and he was choked up and crying and I ran in my Birkenstocks all the way down to where, where uh, we were and I walked in the room and I just burst into tears because this is the most amazing thing that I've ever been a part of. And I, when I graduated, I, was, I had a lot of other job offers to be a translator and work in Mali with this woman who works with Doctors Without Borders. And before that, I had been working on a Fulbright and you know, I thought that maybe I'm gonna go to Tunisia and work with, do this Fulbright and this is gonna look really great on my resume and all these things. And now I have not just like done all this stuff on this campus, but I've really changed my life. I have done something that means that I have lifted myself up and I've lifted my coworkers up and I've really acted in true solidarity, which means that you don't just do things that are gonna make you look great, you're gonna do things that are actually gonna change people's lives. We won a $2.25 raise, which is for, I mean, in the last year, just the Airmark raise is, has been 80 cents over the five years that I've worked there, one of them being part of a government raise, so whatever. And, and, and the, according to the negotiator, all I deserved was 10 cents for the next couple years. So for $2.25, that's huge. And we also won free individual health care and uh, $80 for family, family health care. 
So for people who are paying $175 for individuals and up to $400 for families, that's a huge, huge, huge thing. And for people who didn't have health insurance, it's also a huge change. And this is, our contract is over a period of four years, which means that we have four years for people to really have sustainable jobs, sustainable living wage jobs that really change their lives. And I've been able to be a part of that and it's been a real, real blessing. So coming here and sharing my story and talking about what we've done at Loyola is just another cherry on top and we're trying to connect this up and try to figure out what's the next step for Loyola and Loyola students in terms of getting more connected with Chicago workers and the Chicago labor movement and what's happening so that in four years we can you know, be ready to go and fight the company again. Thank you. go a little bit into the break, but I don't want to deny people their breaks. So um, I won't speak too long, but to just recognize obvious, some obvious threads, some wonderful threads between the talks. One is the amazing struggle um, to work through and work against the divide and conquer on so many levels between, uh, you know, around processes of racialization, around uh, workers and students, around uh, faculty and students, you know, class, kinds of class divisions and divisions of power. Um, what are these challenges? And, and I think all our panelists have talked a little bit about how to work through some of those. Um, how do these sort of seemingly local struggles connect to broader visions of the kind of just and beautiful world that we want to live in? Um, and uh, one thing that I was really struck by, obviously, is the kind of the querying of all of these movements that many of you talked about and the sort of connection um, between um, uh, you know, a vision of organizing that's, you know, about, as Abby said, vulnerability and risk, um, uh, the classroom as a space of vulnerability and risk and pleasure, the campus as a space of, um, you know, organizing around some of those broader notions. So there are many other threads, but why don't we open it up and um, hear your thoughts, hear your comments. Wow, that was an awesome panel. You guys are all amazing. Like, that was great. You guys are all like true activist academics and you're an inspiration, so thank you. Um, so I come from SUNY Albany and we have a state group there called Save Our SUNY. And this summer there was a big retreat across CUNY and SUNY campuses and some private schools to create New York Students Rising. So if you are a New York State based student, like go home, look at that and get involved because there is New York State stuff going on. Um, and so my question for you guys is, um, Catherine, you started by saying, you know, it's not true that students are engaged and it's not, but it is, you know what I mean? Like we'll go right. around and we'll do walkouts and we'll have our horns and our whistles and everything and students are indifferent. So my question is how do you balance like trying to grow the movement in numbers but then also cultivate like the leaders and especially the undergrads you already have that are committed because mm -hmm. obviously you can't have the same people just showing up. You have to grow it by numbers but at the same time if that becomes your whole focus, you, I feel like you really lose out on some of these like deeper connections. So if you could speak about that balance, that'd be great. We want to take maybe a few questions and then, and then one of the panels. Okay. Um, I'm from California, so I want to do a tip to you. I'm part of the Defend Public Education movement, and uh, a project called the Vampire Slayers. Uh, and I have a question for you in the UC system, and also if it's relevant, how do you, um, if you believe it's neoliberal policy? and restructuring, how do you link campus activities to cut back in social and health and human services? That's an issue that we face when our then president, who's now retired, said, you know, we know you have to push for higher education and, you know, forget about, I mean, health and human services because it's a trade-off with our California budget. That's one thing. And then, I'm particularly concerned, having been in a college at San Francisco State University, which has now been abolished, that what's connected to the struggle is a struggle around curriculum and access. And how do you broaden with the restructuring efforts that are excuse for budgets to raise these larger issues that uh, affect not only who gets to go to school, but what they get to learn? Hi, this question is um, directed at Sandra. I loved the way all of you talked about connecting um, across all kinds of boundaries and so on, and, and I really appreciated connecting local interests and struggles to broader visions. Um, and 
my question is about the boycott of Arizona that's been called, and in particular, um, mixed feelings and advice that I have gotten in talking with people about invitations that I've had to speak in Arizona, mm -hmm. where um, on the one hand, my first impulse was to say, no, I'm boycotting Arizona, I'm not going there. And then some other folks have said, look, you know, you actually, as an outside person, if you're being invited in to talk, you can come in and actually not face the kinds of repercussions. You can come in and actually, you know, speak for solidarity, raise some things and so on. It would be really useful for me to hear what you think about, about how you would like us to respond. Catherine, I don't know if you meant to say this, but at the beginning you said, you talked about a coalition among students, faculty, and administrators. And I would just urge, I mean, I've been hearing a lot about the struggle between faculty and administration. And <laughs> yeah, so I'm a provost and vice chancellor and have been in upper administration for 25 years. And I think if we could partner with those administrators, and there are lots of us, right, if we could partner in this struggle, it would be really powerful. We spend so much time fighting with each other and not really recognizing that neoliberalism, the university's caught in it. And you can't assume that an administrator who makes a decision that supports neoliberalism that that's what's in their heart. Mm -hmm. They're trying to keep the university alive. They're trying to keep it, you know, moving. So it's just a comment and that I would hope we would all try to find those administrators that we can form coalitions with because while we're fighting with each other, all sorts of horror is going on mm -hmm. against the university outside of the university. Um, Jess, I just wanted to say I have a lot of respect for what you do. Um, I worked on the student solidarity campaign at Carleton University in Ottawa for unionizing of Aramark <laughs> workers, which has been really recent and a long fight, and I'd love to exchange ideas on that. Um, and one thing we have, um, I know the structure of education systems are, are quite different, um, but at, uh, at a lot of our universities we have um, student, uh, student union solidarity and basically we have inter-union meetings um, so we can uh, work together on campuses to organize um, in the face of uh, administrative cutbacks in the face of uh, neoliberalism on campus. I'm also, um, my question is about international solidarity. I mean, we sent pizzas to Wisconsin, but there's a lot more we can do. So I wondered if you could touch a little bit on that. Uh, this is so helpful and so smart. And I guess I'm just curious to hear you guys' comments on something I've been thinking about. I teach in a law school and there's been a lot of like um, discussion about how Law schools are graduating more people than there possibly could be jobs for, and our students take out like super, super high amounts of debt, as, a, as many students do. And um, to me, there's obviously like a debt bubble crisis happening, and there's been a discussion about how lots of law schools probably are going to need to close. Um, be and so I guess I'm just like, in this moment where I think there's like some sinking ship feelings, and also some potential levels of crisis where if credit were not available, literally like like just tons of people couldn't go to school anymore, and how like massive that would be for all the people who do go to school on loans. Just trying to think about like how you guys are thinking really big picture about that part of the crisis and whether that makes you have ideas about an utter reinvention of how we think about education or just like where you're going with that because I feel really overwhelmed by those ideas. Okay, great. So why don't we go backwards, start with Jess and go this way and just people can take a minute or two for final comments. I think I'm going to try to respond to yours. Um, in terms of international solidarity, it's kind of hard for us to think about it right now because we're kind of like still in our very small like 200 person cafeteria trying to work out the kinks of having a first contract. And so um, a lot of it is just with like between worker and worker. So getting more workers to not, not just me like or whoever was on the committee uh, starting to meet up with each other, but between the workers who weren't possibly leaders on the campaign to work with each other. And then a lot of people who are involved with um, things outside of work, like if they're involved with the Chinese labor network or some sort of like Latino thing that's happening in their neighborhood because uh, Chicago's super separated. Um, 
then having like one African American worker go with her Latina coworker to talk about those issues. So it's still happening like within a Chicago context. Um, but the only other thing that I that I could speak on in terms of an international presence is what my union is doing. And since I now take, I'm not sure of how involved you are with Unite Here stuff. Pretty involved. Okay. Um, is um, is whatever the union is doing, getting more workers involved in that and then having them go abroad. So there's a big campaign against Lufthansa who is an airline company and one of the, um, the company that supplies their food is called Sky Chefs and they have had several labor violations and e even like actual bacteria found in their food. And so there have been campaigns against them. Air France pulled their contract from them, Trader Joe's pulled their contract from them, there's pressure to put on, or putting pressure on CVS to pull their contract from them. And so Sky Chef workers going abroad to talk to, to um, Lufthansa. So this, it was last week, there was a conference in Germany and so workers went there. And so as these campaigns get bigger, if there's like, as there's a bigger Aramark campaign, or not Aramark, because Aramark is in Philadelphia, but Sodexo is French. So when there's a big Sodexo campaign, there are food service workers who go abroad to France to speak at, on these panels, and that happened last year. But other than that, um, there isn't really like a, a broad network for creating international relations, so it's a lot harder on my side. Well, okay, uh, the, um, this idea of getting students involved in, in activism is a challenging one. And one thing that I've learned, um, which surprised me, is that often my notion of involvement wasn't the same as a lot of students. Like, I actually had students in class tell me they were really involved in campaigns because they had signed a petition or something like that. And I mean, and so partly it was like, people don't actually know what it means. They've never experienced that. So they feel like they're getting involved, but they don't know how and they don't know what, you know, they don't have role models of how to do that. Um, and so I think partly we have to be more fluid about what it means to how to get involved. But I think also the reality is as student organizing, it's like there's lots and lots of trial and error and lots of failure. And it's the same as all social movements. We, we lose and we lose and we lose until we win. And we don't know necessarily we're gonna win and we don't know when that upsurge will come. So I think that what the principles that we should be building in the meantime are the principles um, that we want to be in place when that upsurge comes. And so I think, Dean, your question about this impending collapse of the bubble bursting, I do think it's already unsustainable, the student loans people can't pay back. Um, it's already unsustainable that people aren't even getting jobs out of college. So, I mean, it feels like there's this impending space for upsurge, and if we have in place the principles of response, which would be that we collectivize the problem. It's not an individual problem. It's not, uh, it's not an individual, individual solution. Like with the foreclosure, if we say this is a collective problem that there's foreclosures, and we need collective response. So building on campuses now this notion of collectivizing the problem of student debt and student um, loans, and also building the notion of public transparency about that money and public responsibility, um, public accountability for that money. And then also building in the notion that when some of these student upsurge ha happen, they happen quickly and we need better models of developing leaders in the moment because we know certain people feel more comfortable being in leaders and they step to the front of the line. And we need to be, you know, practice in our, you know, learning from Egypt, learning from uh, China, learning from places where there's large scale and fast organizing about um, better models of large scale response in an upsurge moment so that it doesn't take us by surprise. Because I, I do think it has, this collapse is, has, to, has to be coming at any moment. And then we may be seeing thousands of students in the street, more tens of thousands of students. Um, so, you know, I was writing one, one of these days and this line came to me and it's again about Ohio. And I, I it was very obvious to me that this, um, sort of zombie land of Ohio is rife with alien forms of life. And somehow, somehow, somewhere, the meth cooking zombie and the diseased alien has to unite. And, and for me, then I started figuring out where are these points where the meth cooking zombie and the diseased alien unites. Well, as a queer man, male bodied person, sex bars, sex clubs, you know. So, I mean, from there I began to think, you know, even like Foucault has one line where he says, not all forms of life have been brought under biopower. So there are some, like, there's like in History of Sexuality, chapter five, two lines. So I'm like, dude, you only wrote two lines around that? that 
this forms of life didn't come under biopower. So for me then, it's to finding those points where like sort of the bringing back of death and life into these sort of channels of biopower can be disrupted and maintained because people need to have access. So for me, it's very clear, like for, uh, for instance, an Ohio State campus, our health insurance policy um, only covers, has, has, a, has a medical insurance cap, has a cap on prescription medications. So when I went to get my medications, like uh, my first month's medication bill was around $2,000 and I was, I was like awestruck. And then I slowly started finding out other students with long-term chronic illnesses, what they were doing. They were, they were either taking student loan or they were, we, we had to go for physician's assistance programs. So then we started having conversations and meeting with the um, Ohio University, State University Board of Directors. And we sort of started saying, look, if you bring out the disability studies quarterly and it's kind of like, it's really shameful that this news goes public that you don't cover our health insurance. And so it kind of worked, um, but it worked in this move of buying us off probably for someone else um, and someone else was probably taken off. So I think in that context, for me, it is continuously finding those places where um, as Amber said, and as Kiwi J has taught me, is to continuously finding those places where I think disease and life sort of comes together and can be sort of intervened. I think those are the points where long-term visioning and planning and loving will happen. Um, I kind of want to answer everything, but I won't. Um, in terms of the like, organizing, I think at least at Davis, one of the things that really mattered was multi-pronged and multi-kind of tactic, right? So you have folks who are really into occupations given the complicatedness of what occupation is as a tactic. Um, that's one approach, you have people who wanted to go around marching and I definitely was in those marches where people did not care at all when you walked by and just like literally put their head down in their book and people were yelling in their faces and that's really frustrating. Um, but on March 4th, which was actually interesting, um, I couldn't do too much totally public organizing because of my position at the university, um, but I could do some organizing of things that weren't um, super, um, couldn't be read as, as overly aggressive. Um, so I worked with some friends to organize a, a happening, is what we called it, a little retro, um, where a lot of students who actually didn't feel comfortable, and, and professors and staff who didn't feel comfortable going to um, the big, kind of more aggressively read protests, were able to come and like make art and do things like edit the principles of community that govern our, our campus so well all the time, but actually call out kind of how they don't work, uh, or do a map of the campus that actually showed kind of where things were happening and like how different departments were being affected by budget cuts in ways that you could actually kind of massify it and see it on the kind of campus level. Um, so it really helped to have students be able to do things and uh, participate and, and feel like they were doing things that actually mattered, um, even if they weren't necessarily read outside of that moment as, as all that um, meaningful. I, I, it was a really great thing. Um, and I also think classes matter and, and curriculums matter. Um, and I, Liz Montegari was teaching a class that winter of the, um, well actually the, this spring before all the protests started, I was teaching an introduction to women and gender studies class for 200 students where we talked directly and explicitly about neoliberalism in the university. Um, and then the winter before the March 4th protest, uh, Liz was teaching a class that was organized entirely, an upper division queer studies class organized entirely around the politics of privatization and neoliberalism where the last entire last section was on higher education policy, which led up directly to the protest, um, which is why they were able to make a giant banner and make uh, um, these patches that all the students were wearing around that read Imagine Otherwise, inspired by uh, like Lisa Dugan and Jose Munoz's Hope and Hopelessness piece. Um, this integration of kind of the curriculum and classes into the actual activism um, mm -hmm. that also included statements from people like QEJ, and I'm actually really excited to start teaching Desiring Change next week, um, the report, because showing students when things work and like how different people are making things happen uh, and integrating kind of the theory and, and the practice in really, um, really effective ways, and sometimes not effective, <laughs> but often in effective ways, um, seems to really change their perspective on what's possible and I think actually um, affect the whole campus culture. So. And um, I would just add, um, you were asking about apathy uh, among university students um, when it comes to mobilizing uh, dissent. And one of the things that I've really learned over the past couple of years is to, uh, to look to the high schools because in Arizona, where the activism is, isn't at the university at all. I mean, it's at, it's at the high schools. It's these students who are in Mexican American studies and that's why the state is trying to shut down Mexican American studies. But I wanted to also talk about the boycott a little bit. Is, is that Stephanie? 
Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, Beth. Um, I can't tell you how important the boycott has been to us in Arizona. HB 2281 and SB 1070 were just the beginning of this legislative assault on um, uh, not just brown people, but uh, any uh, marginalized population in the state. Um, Russell Pierce, uh, after HB 2281 and SB 1070 were signed, quickly moved on to an attack of the 14th Amendment and uh, what he calls anger babies. I'm sure you have followed that. The only thing that saved us from um, from uh, Brewer signing that into law, uh, his attack on, on, on the 14th Amendment, that is, was that 60 CEOs, very wealthy people in the state of Arizona, got together, people that we would find odious, uh, got together and wrote a letter uh, to Brewer saying, don't you dare sign this, this bill because we are so suffering from the boycott. The boycott worked. It is so amazing how effective uh, the boycott worked. And it not only worked in that, in that kind of measurable, tangible way, but it worked for those of us on the left in the state of Arizona who so desperately felt um, beaten down, worn down, as I was trying to get at in, in, uh, in, in, in my talk. It was so important to us to see that uh, people outside of Arizona weren't coming to Arizona uh, and were loudly not coming to Arizona. So recently, it, it didn't take me any time at all to decide that I would cancel my, my trip to the National Women's Studies Association meetings. I'm, I'm sorry that they're not boycotting in WSA, that is, uh, the state of Georgia. Uh, and um, uh, because I was asking people and relying on, on my friends and family to, to not come to Arizona during that peak time, uh, it, it, it makes a lot of sense to me to not go to NWSA this year in Atlanta, Georgia, and so I canceled my, my, um, my trip uh, there next month. I think it would have been next month. Um, that said, uh, the boycott in Arizona has waned, uh, largely because, uh, because uh, the boycott stopped uh, the, the, the attack on the 14th Amendment, at least for now, but also because a federal district judge, Judge Bolton, uh, issued an injunction on uh, SB 1070, taking the wind out of it. So, uh, for, and so for now, uh, there aren't those active calls for a boycott, so I would say, you know, if I were in your position, I would take it on a case-by-case -case basis and, and, and think about who it is that is um, extending an invitation, you know, to come talk in Arizona. And is there a way, if you do come talk in Arizona, to stay at somebody's house instead of staying at a hotel? But again, do it loudly. Let, let, let somebody know um, and, um, and speak out against, against the xenophobia. Let's give a warm, huge, raucous applause to our panel. Yeah.